Hey, hey, everyone. It is Miss Flo, and you are watching and listening to my podcast, Go With The Flow. I appreciate you guys for tuning in and joining us in our conversation, a space where I have the opportunity to talk about whatever I want, how I feel, and have great conversations with friends, former students, things of that nature. Uh, Say hi to the folks, Ziggy. Hello. My name is Ziggy. It's great to be back, everyone. I've missed you guys been on here yeah if you're new to the podcast ziggy is my former student and current intern at the high school that i work at so i really appreciate them for really coming on and really having these amazing conversations uh this episode i will be doing a review of quantum mania uh heads up there will be some spoilers so if you want to kind of take a pause on this stream, that's perfectly fine because I'm going to post it later. It stays on Twitch for six days. And then I post it on my YouTube channel, Noir Vibes DC. So feel free to check it out uh, afterwards. But if you already seen it and you want to share your thoughts about the film, feel free to participate in the chat. Because again, the whole reason that I'm live streaming on Twitch is so that it's not just, you're not just hearing my opinion, we get to hear your thoughts as well. We have a jam-packed show and then we'll have another uh, host to come in, another uh, former student of mine, uh, Saquon, that will be joining us later in the show. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into today's topics. But oh, wait, wait, first, I almost forgot. It's Women's History Month, and I want to take the opportunity. Yay! Yeah, yay! Girl power, and I want to take this opportunity to really promote um some of these women entrepreneurs, the brands that I have discovered at various uh, pop up shops um throughout the city. Um, I'm wearing some now, so I want to just go ahead and share with you guys because. These brands are absolutely amazing. And I want you guys to follow them on IG. The earrings that I'm wearing are from Glam Station uh, to match my whole ton ensemble, as you can see here. If you're listening to the podcast, I'm so sorry <laughs> that you can't see the outfit. But um, please make sure if you want like earrings like this, they're heart shaped with like a cheetah print on them. This is from Glam Station. Follow them on IG so that you can connect to their website. Um, and then the shirt that I'm wearing that I just actually love, and I don't usually, you know, get tan shirts, but I really love the design from this artist. And um, she will be at Blurred Con. I was hoping she would be at Awesome Con, but she said like she would definitely be at Blurred Con. So the young artist that I am promoting for Women's History Month here is Chiari. If you are a huge fan of Japanese pop art, she is the artist to visit. She sells fanny packs, t-shirts, hoodies, a plethora of other items. I truly fell in love with her work and you need to go check it out. You can follow her at Chiari Art on Instagram, and you could go to her website, chiari.com. All right. Now, um, we can go ahead into, like, the latest news that's been trending this week. There's been a lot going on, and some of these topics has created, like, generated a lot of buzz. But the first thing I want to go into is one of, like, my, one of my favorite actress, Selena Gomez. She recently had to take a break from social media. and. Honestly, I don't blame her. Uh, she has been receiving a lot of negative feedback uh, from internet trolls, and it's completely unfair. Like, yeah, I mean, they've been making fun of her weight, and it was. I think the the final straw was like the fans saying that were speculating that Kylie Jenner was throwing shade about Selena's laminated eyebrows 
That's so, like, bizarre, though. Even if she... W- which is, like, I've never even seen them to interact. Sorry if they have in the past and I just don't know, but, like, if that is true and she was throwing a shade at her, I feel like that's just petty and, you know, unwarranted. But it hasn't been confirmed. Like, uh, Kylie has denied this. It's just... It's, I, okay. think, I think the problem is it's just fans being toxic. Like, they keep... And that's, that's, like, a big problem. Yeah, and I totally agree with you. That's a big problem with the fandoms. They usually create most of the beefs or the feuds between celebrities in the first place and which is it 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 contradicts themselves because it's very detrimental to it's going to be detrimental to somebody during the field because someone has to be the bad guy so it's like you're putting your fave celebrity in the front the forefront to look like you know crazy and it's giving a negative uh you know backlash and feedback which is not what fans are supposed to do right i mean there's plenty of other things you could criticize Kylie for doing but like this situation I mean it, uh, like Selena said like she's too grown for this like she's 30 like when she yeah. was like getting into like petty social media beefs with anybody like Selena is what I think one of the least or not at all problematic celebrities that we have in our generation she's an overall sweet person. I loved her on Disney with a star like uh, Wizards at Waverly Place. Mm-hmm. Amazing singer. And now she has like a series on Hulu with working with some um, like legendary uh, comedic actors. So it's just like, this is completely unwarranted while battling lupus. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah. I don't I, I, can, I, mean, I commend her for that. For sure, and I'm like, I'm I'm glad that she publicly is stating um, that she's taking a social media break, and why? Because like sometimes you just need a digital vacation, you know what I mean? Just kind of really disconnect mm-hmm. from all the drama and just have a reset. And it's really showing a, a, a more human side uh, to being a celebrity because people forget that, like they're people too. So it's like. Give them a break. Mm-hmm. I just think that we just need to step, take a, well, some people just need to take a step back and realize that celebrities are people, they have feelings, and that they're not just like these dolls that you can just play around with. I just feel like people just need to be more, you know, empathetic. Yeah, it's, you, it's definitely lacking on the internet. So I hope that she feels better. And um, that everybody would just lay off her case. <sighs> the news doesn't really get much better. So there's this, been this recent collab that is upsetting the fandom all over. Um, if you haven't heard, uh, Chloe Bailey and Chris Brown uh, recently dropped a new track called How Does It Feel? And the fans are not feeling it whatsoever. Most of them. Um, any, do you have any speculation as to why some people would be against this collaboration? Well, I would think the obvious reason is because of Chris Brown's behave, abusive, you know, behavior and his controversial past. So you know, uh, I guess a lot of people are criticizing Chloe Bailey. You know, as a woman, why are you working with someone who has been known for and has a history of abusing women in the industry. That's why a lot of people are looking at her sideways because she's supposed to be like the up and coming new generation of R&B artists. So I think a lot of her fans are turning, mm, I'm going to say criticizing her. I'm not going to say turning on her. Yeah. But yeah, criticizing her for the uh, collab. Yeah, I don't think she's like in... The cancellation box. I don't think they put her yeah. there yet, but they're definitely was just like, I listened to the song, I watched the video. Um, I don't know. I part of me feels like this may have been a bit of a pol- uh, publicity stunt, just to it most definitely to, was you know to get attached to the song. But I'm just like, I don't know if it was worth it. If if you take, a look, I mean, if you take a look at the video, it it 
doesn't visually <laughs> make sense. Like, if the song is about breaking up with this person, it's like, shouldn't there be more interaction with the singer? You know what I mean? Like, if I was to compare it to another collab in terms of, like, a troubling relationship or um, or uh, the, what is it called, like, romantic triangle, like, if you look at Brandy and Monica, they were in majority of the scenes together or, like, within the scenes with the dude that they were fighting over. Mm-hmm. Which made visually, which made sense visually. Um, when you looked at the video, I mean, granted, Chloe looks great. Her hair looked amazing. You know, she was working the bodysuit, but it was like it was mostly focused around her, and not so much the relationship that was like falling apart. Like, Chris Brown was like barely in it. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I'll just say this. I just feel like this was a wasted opportunity of a collab. Like, I see, I feel like these women, like, women that have recently collabed with Chris Brown, I just want to ask you, like, what are you, what are you guys gaining from it for real, for real? Because any, like, I feel like the recent, any collab with Chris Brown has not even reached number one on the charts. Like, Chris Brown, even in his, like, own discography, Chris Brown only has, like, one or two, I think three at most number one hits mm-hmm. in his whole entire career. And I don't think, like, they need him to chart. But I think they're just doing it for the, like, to reach a, a certain demographic. You know what I mean? Right. But I just feel like for Chloe, that's not her demographic. That's, like, the shade room demographic. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like, Chris Brown fans are not her fans. Those were the people that were literally judging her for coming out about her sexuality. Not sexuality. Coming into her sexuality. You know, feeling herself and being, you know, a mature adult. Those were the ones judging her in the comments and calling her all types of names. So I'm saying, like, why is her marketing team trying to make her reach out to that demographic? I just feel like this was just a publicity stunt that just was not worth it. It just didn't reap any benefits, and the song is genuinely, like, not even that good. No shade to her. She has amazing vocals. It just felt underwhelming. Yeah, I feel like her with her vocal range, there are a lot of other uh, R&B singers that she could have matched with that could have complemented her style. Like, immediately that comes to mind is either, like, The Weeknd, or Lucky Day that could have really elevated the song. Mm-hmm. And I think is is just more marketable because they don't have anything really controversial um, that I know of in the past. But it also yeah. brings up another question in terms of like, when uh. will the fans or like, or fans of R&B eventually forgive Chris Brown for his past let me, let me, okay, now, and can I, I'll answer that question. Um, I feel as though, like, we don't have, I feel like Chris Brown does not deserve to be forgiven. Let me be honest with you, because his response was very much like, like, when he was getting response for the hate he was getting for collabing with uh, Chloe Bailey, it was just given like, I don't care, I'm gonna continue to be me, and F y'all, I'm rich. Like, it's just, it's, it's like, you're supposed to be sorry, and you're supposed to be moving on from the past. First of all, he said he did, he um assaulted, I don't want to bring this up, because I don't want to like, I don't like to bring up, you know, a certain events, because I don't want to like, you know, demonize the victims or anything, but we have to do it in order to you know, bring, bring up pinpoints in the art, in the conversation. Right. So, you know, and the incident with Rihanna, that happened in 2008. Homeboy was 19 when that happened. You were an adult. So I don't like the making it seem like it wasn't a big deal as it was. And that's not your only instance. That's your biggest instance with, you know, abusing women. That's the biggest one, but it's not your only instance. And then you have colorist, like, tendencies also mm, I remember just problematic as well so and homophobic you called mm-hmm. frank f you you like punch frank ocean for no reason and called him the f slur multiple times that's a hate it's just crime. like 
That's a hate crime. It's just like you have no redeemable qualities and you don't deserve forgiveness. And it just feels like I just don't. I hate that y'all feel like we're attacking Chris Brown. Like Chris Brown has not been skating past these couple of years. People still love Chris Brown. The radio going to still play his music. He still gets uh, collabs. Like, it's just like nobody, like, he still has money in his pocket. He still go on tour. He just getting criticism now. Like, I, I just feel like, and then the bringing up the whole, like, Johnny Depp and all the white guys that I'm going to say, quote, unquote, got away with it. Like, that's just like, you're trying to change the subject for me. I don't really buy into that. Because, like, R. Kelly got away with it for years before he got, like, mm-hmm. arrested. He just now is serving his sentence. Right. So it's just, like, I don't really care about you bringing up white people that got away with it. I'm not focused on them. Like, I don't want – I just feel like that's a cop-out, if that right. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It, I guess you're getting – he's using it as, like – like, as you said, like, a cop-out. Um I guess, like, from my perspective, like, I feel like if he, if he was making more so an effort to, like, start healing and Mm -hmm. was actually showing, like, changes in his behavior, then I think the fans would be more forgiving. But I think, like, at the time of the incident and when he was uh, sentenced to it, like, he didn't serve time for that assault uh, on Rihanna. He, um, He got community service and probation. And a lot of people felt like, that was such a light sentence. I felt like I feel like if he were to serve actual jail time, um, I feel like that would be justice served because you can't uh, like assault someone like that, right? And it's just like I feel like domestic violence isn't taken as seriously as it should because there's, do you know how many jokes like people are out here? They make a joke of that situation all the time. Like, oh, I'm a shorty act up. I'm a Chris Browner. Like that stuff, like that, just just being very. I feel like it's this very sensitive and very. I mean, insensitive to the situation and to Rihanna. It's just foul. It really yeah. is. So I mean, I hope that Chris Brown eventually gets healed and um just realize, like, he has to understand, like, it, it, people that may have experienced or witnessed domestic violence will definitely feel some type of way about him, and he has to accept that but he can't I think the point that he was trying to make is that there is a double standard when it comes to like black celebrities doing wrong and white celebrities doing wrong which I do believe that yeah that's definitely an issue but he has to also realize like for some of them they may have gotten therapy or help and haven't it's not a continuous behavior like it might have been like an isolated thing that they did in the past but then are now um better like you haven't heard them do anything wrong but with like him like he just recently threw a fan's phone um into the crowd while while she was on stage just like taking a selfie and documenting the experience and just this whoop Phone away. You don't know why celebrities keep doing that. Like that has been a recurrent thing at concerts this past year. Just throwing people's phones. I'm just like, I hope he gets healed. That's all I can, yeah. I can really say. Is just like, hope he gets healed. And um, at this you point, nigga, you, oh, can I say that? <laughs> at this point, you are thirty something. I mean, there's always one for growth, but like, when are you gonna stop, like? Blame it like I hope he stop blaming people or like you know going on defense mode and actually seek help. Like take accountability. Yeah, take accountability. Yeah. All right, but on to brighter news. I mean, we've heard this like earlier that um Miss Yara has been cast as Tinkerbell, the blackish and grownish star. Uh, has truly grown into this role. If you've seen like the photos, the, they released the photos, the first look um, as her being Tinkerbell. It's for the new, the live action Disney movie. Hold on, let me make sure I get this right. Peter Pan and Wendy. And oh my God, it looks so good. It's definitely serving Black Girl Magic. I mean, yeah. this is, this, I believe she's going to kill the role for sure. And she has, like, this very sweet, bubbly 
personality, I think that definitely fits with Tinkerbell. But then, of course, you're going to have those racists that are very upset that a black woman woman. is playing a traditionally white character. Um, And so this, I mean, this has actually been a debate, not just um, for this particular role, but like for several, and we've seen this over the years, there's been this debate um, over traditionally white characters being, being portrayed by black and one side of it is, you know, why can't we just create um, our own Black characters mm-hmm. as opposed to just making pre-existing characters Black? And then the mm-hmm. other side of it is that most of the characters that they're playing are fictional and their race isn't really much of a factor or impacts the the story itself so um what is your opinion on this um my opinion on it is simple as this i think that i don't mind uh traditionally like white fictional characters being played by any person of color i feel as though we're at a time where people are recognizing that you know white people aren't the only type of typecast, you know what I'm saying? There's other people that can play certain roles. There are other people that can play roles and that can open to a broader audience. I feel like everybody's trying to see themselves in media. So I I think that, you know, making somebody, you know, that's a fake, like Tinkerbell is literally a fairy, a fictional creature. She could be any color or any race she wants to be. There are black girls that have dressed up as Tinkerbell. And when I was little, I loved Tinkerbell. I had the game on my little 3DS. I had the I dressed up as her for Halloween. I had her tea party sets, but she never <laughs> looked like me. Yes, <laughs> I like I was. I had my tea, my little Tinkerbell phase. And now I think about it, like if I was a little girl growing up now, I would feel seen. It, I feel like they're gonna have a if they have the Tinkerbell merch. The doll and she's black. I'm gonna buy. It. I don't care. Um, but <laughs> I just think that that is. I think it's a beautiful thing. I feel like it's important to have our own characters, but I think it's important to also, you know, if you want to rewrite history the right way and not the white way, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like you just you add color in there. There's nothing wrong with that. I think what is wrong is that when people get so outraged at it for like. Like, it's, like, a bad thing to be a minority. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like, it's an outrage or they feel erased or anything. I just feel like white people are realizing that they're not ready. I don't think they're ready to share the spotlight. You know mm. what I mean? And that's not okay because they're so used to, you know, everything on TV looking like them and presenting like them. But imagine being a minority in America and never being able to, barely being able to see anybody like you growing up. That's like, that's very detrimental not being able to see people that look like you and only being able to see a certain race of people. Then you get an idea, you get a beauty standard in your head, and now you feel like you don't meet that if you don't see yourself on TV. Because mm. I've been like, I've gone through that growing up, being on Disney, like watching Disney channels growing up, seeing Hannah Montana. But the only like show we had growing up was like That's So Raven, right? Casey Undercover, mm-hmm. but they were. No, they weren't. They didn't really look like me, but some yeah, they're, they're gonna fair skin, fair skin, yeah. But I feel like this one having more black women, Asian women, any any person of color in a traditionally white role, I love it. I live mm-hmm. for it. Yeah, I do agree. Like representation is so important, and like I said before, like Tinkerbell's race isn't really a factor in the story so she can be played by technically anybody and it definitely opens the door to because like and i kind of did this with my class when they were starting to build their character description for their psa and just realized it's like well when you're describing what the character looks like or their personality it's like does race really matter because some, some people be like, okay, well, 
why don't we make Shaft white or, you know, Black Panther white? But in those stories, like them being black, it's it very is part, intricate. It's, it's part of, yeah, it's part of yeah. the story. So it's it's not the same thing. So um personally, like I am so excited to see this. I'm assuming like we're both gonna go see this movie when it comes out. Um I have not seen the release date as of yet, but we'll keep monitoring it. But I'm excited um to see how this turns out. And of course the little mermaid as well, that'll be coming out soon. All right, moving on to we're just gonna talk about this briefly. Uh uh me and Ziggy are both fans of RuPaul's drag race. And yes. there's there's so many things that have are going on with the season. Are we dealing with some producer shenanigans or or some of the eliminations justified? You uh-huh. know, that's have been the lingering questions that have been going on lately. We're gonna talk about the two latest episodes. Uh the oh. last week we had the crystal ball to celebrate the fifteenth season of RuPaul's Drag Race and the two hundred episodes. Two two hundred episodes. Just to think like it Can you started, believe it? Starting from logo, like a very obscure uh channel that I don't mm-hmm. think most people could get to like the VH1 and to now the MTV. And, like the brand has expanded so much, not just like in the US, but globally. Um, yeah, it's I mean, be- it's a beautiful thing. And you have to think about this. This is a queer show and it is mainstream. That is such a big thing. And I I love it. I love um I love what it produces. I love what it produces. I love what it, you know. But it gives right. I just feel like this show is has opened so many doors for so many careers and opportunities. You know what I'm saying? It, it, for sure. I mean, any. I would say even if you don't get the crown, if you are a rude girl, your price, your your stock automatically goes up. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, mm-hmm. Like, look at Shangela. She didn't walk away with the crown, but she getting that HBO money. I was you know talking I mean? to my brother about this earlier. We were saying that, like, if you, yeah, even if you don't win, you're going to, if you're a fan favorite or if you're entertaining, you're going to be booked. Like, you have, even with Ru, even within, like, the RuPaul universe, like, Slim Heights did not win the crown, but she has her own show, Drag Race Canada. You have drag queens doing, performing on the uh, Las Vegas residency. You have drag race, you uh, Nikki, even Nikki Doll has a drag race in France. I just like, think that's so amazing. Like it's just, it's just a great brand that really does elevate the queens. And if the queens utilize um, the brand correctly, they can really go far. Um, I've seen them even create like their own YouTube channel and you know build like amazing talk shows I meaning they're not even waiting for the networks to come to them like they're really taking the Creating initiative and yeah like Bob and Monet sibling what sibling rivalry I think even Maddie Morphosis Maddie uh, Morphosis I think it's like give it to me straight I think I've I've seen it yeah I've seen it. I mean there's just so many of the rude girls that have really taken their brand and use the RuPaul boost and really like have elevated their career so it, it's truly an amazing sight to see now um with the crystal ball mm. and I think there's always been a question with the balls in terms because you know usually they have to present three outfits and one of them being made in the workroom, in the workroom. um I would say this compared to the other balls that we have seen, we have seen some um questionable um just oh my god, just uh, hot messes on the runway in the past. Hot glue gun messes. Yes, but I didn't really see that this season. I think the critique Wait. That we, did you not see it as much or did you not see it at all? say for like on this ball on the crystal ball runway 
in terms of the outfits mm-hmm. that were made, because I know there was mm-hmm. another design challenge earlier, but I would say for this design challenge, I didn't see like anything that was like obviously terrible. Okay, so it. we're not talking about the second list because I'm gonna Lucy and Selena Mama that was garbage. Okay. <laughs> yes. But I think yeah. Yeah, because like I was um there were some questionable looks with well let me go back and explain like the challenge. Yeah, let's get into yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Let me let's get into this. So yeah, so you had the first look was paying homage to RuPaul's iconic a uh, race jumper that she would have mm-hmm. for like the promos so they had to create an interpretation of that the second challenge was that they could choose from any of the previous balls that have been have seen been on seen. RuPaul's drag race and you know create their own version of it and then, of course, I was mostly oh, I'm sorry but yeah and then the third look was they had to make an outfit utilizing crystals to represent like the crystal ball. Okay. I was mostly excited to see the second look because I wanted to see the queen. That was like the most like diverse one to me. Meaning that like you could pick like the balls that they had chosen, like they had given them to choose from. I thought they were like very fun sounding. So I was mostly, mostly excited with the queens would do like into how they were interpret interpret those like their favorite ball look. So mm-hmm. I was excited for that one. Yeah. Who do you think was strong in all three categories? Okay, obviously I think that Sasha Kobe was obviously strong. Um her bag look was hilarious, but also cl- it was glamour. She looked stunning and it was very well thought and planned out so i really like that her crystal look was very complimentary toward her skin tone she was very right when she was like i'm going to do a gold because everyone's doing silver she knows how to make herself look good she knows how to compliment herself so i was mm-hmm. really applauding her and i feel like every look that she produced she's a very beautiful woman so mm-hmm. i feel like anything she comes out with like you're beautiful you're linda evangelista you're a model <laughs> you walk out there in a fucking diaper like but she didn't, start, but she like, doesn't. And that's so what? Important, but she doesn't walk out in a diaper. She puts an effort. But she doesn't. In, like, she puts she in the work. Like, I'm saying she's so look. beautiful. Like, she doesn't have to try, but she does. And she's an amazing performer. So I'm not dissing her at all. Yeah, she I eats love Sasha the Kobe. runway each time. She does. I, wow. I, mean, I have not seen not one bad look from Sasha whatsoever. Mm. She she just, like, no crumbs. Yes. And I'm, I applaud her for keeping up the, because I know she has a very high career and reputation outside of Drag Race, and she's very big in the drag community. So for mm-hmm. her to come on Drag Race and keep up that momentum, because mm-hmm. a lot of girls will come on Drag Race and say that they are big queens and they don't really do as well. Right. And I'm glad that she's you know keeping up and she's the front one front runner for me, runner for me. Yeah. And the she- show obviously. Well, not according to Lisa LaDuke. Please. Uh, We're we're about to get into that in a second, but I think, like, for sure, we would definitely see uh, Sasha in the finals. Um, I also think Mistress did very well. I think she, her, all three looks were, like, consistently done well. And I think everybody else kind of had their weakness and strengths with Mm. the various categories. Um... Our our homegirl Spice, poor poor Spice, she was sent home last mm-hmm. episode, and uh, there's been a lot of chatter online. People are saying like she, I don't didn't think deserve, she, deserved- she didn't deserve to be in the bottom or sent home, um, and a lot of people are speculating like, oh, this is more like a producer edit as opposed to um the actual competition, you know, like, the, based on no, I know the competition. So, like, for story plot purposes type yeah. stuff. Yeah. And um, to be, like, this may be a bit controversial, but, like, part of me feels like, for those that have recently gone home, Jax and Spice, inter- if we were going by competition, 
and if Rue didn't throw that, you know, um, twist at it, like you could choose who to save. Honestly, I should went home. I should have went home during the lip sync. The yeah, li you know, the li lip sync challenge. I really think that she would went home there. Uh, and then Jax, who is a is an amazing performer and dancer, just hasn't really been bringing it on the runways. So I would think like Jax would have went home eventually. During, that episode, yeah, yeah, during the crystal ball challenge. So I think either way, like those that is really raining. Jesus, like Lord. Okay, just don't let the power go out. Okay, um, mm -hmm. before we get to the review, but I think at this point in the competition, Jax and Spice would have went went home by now. Mm -hmm. So, like, I would just say that I just think they just didn't go home during the right challenge. So I would I would say that. Um, and this, like, the recent episode that we just saw that aired tonight, um, do you agree with the results? Um, do I agree with the results of who got sent home yes. and who won the challenge? Yes, because this challenge um... they did... This was like, it was an improv challenge, but also the queens were paired up to conduct interviews with some very interesting celebrities. We had Charo, Coochie Coochie Coo, um, <laughs> who was Ariana Grande's brother? Ricky Grande. And we had another notable drag queen. What's her name? <laughs> I don't remember, girl. Oh my god! I mean, I like I've seen, like, like she's been on uh, RuPa, RuPaul Drag Race before. Um, I'm just not really too familiar with her drag, but we had like this very yeah. eccentric drag queen that was on here, and mm. it was it was if they didn't pick up on it, it was like an improv challenge where they kind of had to catch what their interviewee was throwing and. Mm -hmm. A lot of the queens had butterfingers. This was a hard. This was a harder challenge because I don't think they understood the assignment. And yeah, a lot of queens were missing jokes. They weren't giving back the same energy. It was just like it was. Some queens were just falling flat this episode, and it was kind of hard for me to watch. Yeah, it was. It was um, very sad. Um, so that. So again, I'll ask you. Uh, do you agree with? Who was the top and who was the bottom? I'm gonna be honest. Um, I agree so far as who was in the bottom, but different placements. If I'm being honest. Okay. I don't. Um. So this is my thing. Sasha, <laughs> Sasha Kobe is going to win Drag Race. <laughs> this is off topic, but she has won three, actually three challenges, main challenges. Not many. Mm -hmm. Three main challenges so far. And I, I I actually I think she did well in the challenge. She I think she delivered because she has that personality where she can during her interview with Charo, I felt like she was giving what she was throwing back at her. I feel like they had some cute little moments. She um she was giving the energy and returning it back. I thought it was a nice interview. Um who I thought was Anitra in the top? I think she was she was safe. Yeah, she was safe. So, uh, Marsha, 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 and Anitra were oh. safe. Yeah, which, I agree with Marsha, Marsha being, mm, she was kind of blank for me. I thought she was going to be in the bottom. It was a lot of queens I thought was going to be in the bottom, but they can't all be in the bottom. Right. Oh, um, not, well, yeah, but <laughs> I was a little surprised at her performance. I, Marsha, 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 I thought that she was a little, you know, taken aback by Charo's, like, you know, kooky personality. She accent. was like kind of lost in her accent. Yeah. I was going to say that in yeah. her accent. So I think that she was lost in translation. So it was, she was kind of looking, you know, she was giving eyelashes, blank stare. So it was like, it was like I just funny, think that though. I think they kind of so did was that funny. On, I think it was kind of done on purpose, to be honest, because it was just like she was trying her best, the hardest to like really understand. But she, I guess, she played it off. So I think that's why she landed safe. I think that was kind of okay. like done on purpose a little bit. Um, I do agree that Malaysia should have been at the bottom. 
Yeah, I agree uh, with that. The, yeah, but with the mm -hmm. top with Sasha in between Lucy, I know she's salty. I, I don't know. I do don't want to. Okay, let me say this because we didn't talk about it. So the beginning of the episode, this is a little drama. The beginning of the episode, the queens are talking about who's the front winner and they're congratulating Sasha on winning two challenges. Lucy is salty AF because she feels like she's not getting a recognition for being the front runner of Drag Race because she feels as though she has won three challenges. Maya asked, she is talking about one main challenge in a mini. And she says that she has won the most iconic challenges in Drag Race history. I think this queen has a case of drag delusion. She is sick. She needs <laughs> medical attention. I I feel like Lucy and many queens are starting to say this that I've watched like re, like reviews of the show. She is starting to become unlikable because I I don't know if it's the edit or if that's her real personality, but it's like she's becoming unlikable because she wants it too much because. She sounds crazy saying that she's kind of a mini challenge. And she's, like, genuinely upset. Like, she's giving Karen vibes. She sounds like a mad white woman complaining to a manager. That is her voice. And I just feel like she's just being – it's not fun to be, like, overly competitive. You're not going to have yeah. fun. No one's going to like you. And it's just doing – she's just doing a little bit too much for me. I think if I had any advice for any future competitor – on RuPaul's Drag Race, I would say, like, don't get be down on yourself if you haven't won a challenge at a certain point. If you are still in the competition, your goal is just to make it to the finale. All you got to do is just probably win, like, two lip sync battles and you have the crown. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, you, this is a... It, you have some really strong contenders in this season. So just because somebody is like winning more than you doesn't mean that you're not a strong competitor. It's just like mm -hmm. a lot of the decisions are like there is really it looks like the judges are nitpicking at a lot of things cuz like we compared to the other seasons where we you can obviously tell like who's struggling who's not and then in some cases it's like they all may have did exceptionally well but like not having the right shoes or they feel like a silhouette isn't done right. Or if, you know what I mean? Just I'm talking like I know fashion to be transparent. I don't, but you get what I'm saying? Like, I think you're pretty fashionable flow. Oh, thank you. No um, problem. But overall it's just, don't be I like so like like down and out because eventually that inner saboteur is going to uh show up and it's going to end up fact like factoring your game like i i think that's what happened with malaysia because i really thought malaysia, i thought she was gonna make it yeah i thought she was like a strong con con contender in the beginning but you could see like how not being at the top or be or like being safe was affecting mm. her and I think well I, I would just say this with the, the lip sync episode she can't lip sync she's not a strong she's lip not a good like she has sass I guess but like lip syncing is not her strong suit yeah um, you know what I mean um, I knew she was gonna go home I, I knew it but <laughs> I just didn't want it to be true because yeah, Selena yeah. S. Titties has been lip syncing for her life. This for is the, the third past time in the three episodes. So it's just like, give it a rest. My brother wants her to stay so bad because he likes her personality and he gets her like banshee drag. Mm. So he's, get, he's living for her. I think she might get Miss Congenial. She might. I, I think she's. I, li I like. I like like she's she's not a like a bitch like she's funny yeah and she's I like mean, not, she doesn't stir the pot like I haven't seen her get into any like real arguments like that no she was, she only threw shade at Noir Lux because it's like Noir she had Lux had the lip sync again and she felt like the um the first round when she did against Miss Stds that she was raw like she felt like why well, should have. <laughs> 
Lux was like, I should have won. She was like, but you <laughs> didn't. But you didn't. It was just so... <laughs> It was no, she, she says, like, little fun, shady things. Like, when Amethyst was like, I'm gagged, I'm still here, y'all. And she was like, us too. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, are oh, you bitch? But that was like, it was it was funny. It wasn't like, I don't think it was like try, her trying to be. Yeah, like, it was, it's not giving mistress. So, but, yeah, uh, yeah I think Miss, yeah. Mrs. Titties may get Miss Congenial. So, I really hope that for her, but. I, like I also, my heart goes out to her because you can feel like her emotions. Um, mm-hmm. When know, she's lip syncing for her life, yeah, mm-hmm. you can feel it. And see, she's amazing. She may be one of the lip sync assassins. Yeah, because she knows how to sell it. It's not so much about like doing stunts all the time. It's about she, you know embodying the song and the musicality and the facial expressions. Yeah, and I she, feel like she understands that. She knows how to sell it for sure. Mm-hmm. All right, so we were, of course we're gonna stay tuned. And we want to see who wins, but like, who do you see at the top? Who's going to the finale? Okay, well, I wanna, I'm, I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna save the best for last because everybody's gonna say her name. I'm gonna talk about the queens that you know needs more shine. I'm gonna say I'm, I see Anitra going to the top. Honestly, I think she's silent, but you know, deadly as mm-hmm. you see in lip sync. I was shocked that she had the lip sync all the time. You know what I'm saying? But anyways, she went, it's, it's she went against Sasha the first round. So like I understand again. that, but that should have been a double chante. But for real. I don't know if they, they can do double chantes on the lip sync smack Perusa. I don't know if that's a a la Perusa, if that's against the rules. But I feel like she did help she she did held hold her hold own. It. She she hold she held her own, so I feel like that was Against Sasha Kobe, like I feel like she's a front, like she's a good contender to be in the top. Obviously, Sasha Kobe. I hope my girl Lux Noir London makes it to the top because she's such a fierce, stunning queen. I feel like she gives looks. Um, and then they're like high fashion, mm. abstract looks. So it's like I I like what she gives to the table. I feel like she does bring it every time. She is. So gorgeous. Yeah. I've never get like I love like I when I first saw her in Meet the Queens, I felt like that was gonna be my favorite. I thought she was gonna be a front runner. I feel like I hope she does not fall behind into the like you know, into the fade into the background. I hope she can at least make it to the, you know, finale for real. If they do like, you know, top three. Or they what what if they do a top five? That could be a strong possibility. I feel like they I don't know. How many are we on? Are we on eight queens now or seven? I lost count. I didn't look. I had the prep for this show. I didn't look at like the final count. And we might be at seven. I think. It might go all the way to us. the it might go all the way to the three, never mind. Or the yeah. two. So yeah, so you so said Anitra. Anitra, Sasha Kobe, and Noor. And if there is a top four, they do that. Uh, Miss, uh, Mistress uh, Isabel Brooks. Okay. I can't, what about you? I would just switch out Noir Lux for maybe Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Um, mm, I, mean, I it's don't. Not, it's not just oh about God. looks. Like Marsha is funny. Yeah, I can agree with that. Yeah. But I do. I can agree with that she's very funny. I was like looking forward to her in this chat. I thought her and Sasha was gonna uh, Sasha ate. Obviously yeah. she won a yeah. challenge. But I thought both of them were gonna eat. I was looking forward to seeing Marsha in her improv challenge because I thought that during the comedy, uh the the what's it called? The Daytona Wins two mm-hmm. sitcom uh challenge. I thought she was really funny working with Anitra and doing a little uh doing her bits. I thought she was very funny. I enjoyed her in that challenge. Right. So I was looking forward to her. So to see her, you know, kind of fumble. I thought she fumbled for me. That that's In just this my episode, opinion. a little bit. Yeah. This, this episode, a little bit. Yeah. So that's I why think. I have Connor out, and it's just like I get that looks aren't important, but I have to like look at you, girl. I think her she, makeup, he's wearing the wig with the hairline. Sorry. Oh my god. I think in terms of her makeup skills have been gradually improving throughout the competition. Her mm-hmm. runways have not as been as strong. I would say yeah, that. Yeah, because you pack what you pack. Like, right. you can't. 
You can't right. change that, girl. Right. But in terms of, like, she can obviously dance, can act, I believe sing. But I think she has most of the skills that she needs to make it to the final four. I feel like with Lux, definitely a look queen. She's, I think she's being overlooked a little bit for her comedy. I don't know if that's because of the edit or, you know what I mean? Because you have a lot of loud queens in the room. I mean, she did have her own in the, in today's improv challenge for sure. Yeah. Um, so, like, I, I guess uh, it's in between. Everybody else that you have listed, and then it's in between. It's like going to be the fight between like Marsha and Lux, for sure. So, um, but yeah, I can't wait to see the next episode. I believe they're doing stand up. Oh that's, no, that's, all, that's always hard. Comedy is it very is. and um, some of these girls aren't funny. I'm just getting flashbacks from what's our girl, um. When she told Rue to stand up. Come on, Candy Muse. It's not Candy Muse. Uh-huh. It's another queen that was just like not. I'm so mad that I'm trying to blame. Oh, and like, uh, what is her name? The girl was like laughing, like you're bombing. Yeah, I tried queen. to like comfort is her. It, um, I think Unica, it was diabetic. Unica. Unica. Oh, Unica. Ooh, ooh, Unica. Ooh, let's not hope for a Unica moment. That's all I have to say. Uh, but moving on to our main event, we are finally going to go ahead and give our review of Ant Man and <laughs> the Wasp <laughs> Quantum Mania. Everybody was like, "We." I think there was so much build up to this movie, especially through. And first of all, before I get into this, I do want to applaud Marvel for doing such an excellent job of like threading all of the characters in various movies. <laughs> oh, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> Woo. Okay, spring is coming. Oh. But I just apply Marvel for really, really intertwining um all these characters together, all these storylines together. And it's a smart marketing decision because it's like everybody feels they have to keep up with all the Marvel movies so they don't miss anything because everything is so interwoven. Like, from the Loki series, there was build-up from that to get to this point. And I thought this was, like, a really good film. And we have... And I would say, like, over the, like compared to all the phases within the Marvel Cinematic Universe... I would say that we, after Thanos, have like a, like a very scary, terrifying villain uh, that we can see throughout that, like throughout the series and several different movies. Uh, so, my God, like this, like I really love the movie. Some people have their reservations about it, but, like, before, again, before I dive into the review, there will be some spoilers. So, uh, if you haven't got a chance to watch it, uh, this film, Ant-Man, his daughter, the whole Pym family gets sucked into the quantum well realm, and it's very Wizard of Oz, and they're just trying to find their way back home, and, of course, the representation the person that represents the Wiz is, of course, is Kang. Shout out to the Hoteps, Kang. Um, who basically has this habit of, like, bargaining with people and fulfilling people's desires and wishes in exchange to get what he wants. And we saw that with Janet, um, the first Wasp. Uh, who was stuck in the quantum realm and was helping Kane try to escape, and that little plot, like that that story in the plot, was so interesting to me because they had this dynamic, like they both desired to get home, 
They're both brilliant scientists that were working together to fix Kane's um, ship that allows him to transport, I'm sorry, to travel through time and through different realities and different universes. But once she got it running and then she touched the machine, she was able to see all the terrible things Kane did, which completely contrast like who she thought he was just based on their interaction like when you first like meet Kane he he looks and kind of has a similar feel to what we saw in the Loki series with the uh he who he he blah, 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 with uh he who remains and the, then as soon as she found out, it was like a switch went off where it just completely snowballed. And I just want first of all just shout out Jonathan Majors, who is has taken on this role because, as I mentioned in other podcasts, any actor that takes on the challenge of being a clone, a twin, multi personalities, and in this case. A variant, meaning basically you're just not just not too many physical changes besides like maybe the costume a little bit for the actor to play like a, a variation of another character, but they have to. It's just, it's also a personality change that they have to perform to really show the difference within these variants. And that is a huge task to do. Also, it's just been a good year for Jonathan Majors. Like, he had Quantumania, Creed 3, which I believe comes out, it came out today, or like this weekend. And um, it was another movie he did towards the end of last year. It's just, he the, the guy is winning. Um, but I really enjoyed his performance and I liked how the characters written mostly uh, let's be honest with the Marvel villains they have this way of creating these villains where it's you know in the past we obviously knew that they were a bad guy because they were doing bad things but Marvel has this way of writing characters where it's not as black and white where we understand their motivation almost to the point where we sympathize with what they're, you know, what they're going through and how, like, they got to this point. Um, It's very, like, basically Kang is almost it's kind of similar with Thanos in terms of their motivation of what they're doing. They're, um... Their goal is to wipe out the other universes to prevent this cataclysm or the universes in eventually will merge and collapse in on themselves. Like, that's what he's trying to prevent. So, you know what I mean? Or just, like, to recreate the singular timeline. But as Janet pointed out, like, He's murdering twi- trillions of people. So, and it's, it's just a tyrant, man. But, um, overall, I think this is, is a very strong film. I think the one drawback, and it's, uh, what I believe most people have an issue with, is that Kang is eventually defeated by Ant Man. Of all people, Ant Man, uh, you know, Kang managed to defeat Thor in another universe, but he gets taken out by Ant Man. So I think you know that's rubbing people a certain way. Um, but Ziggy, how did you feel about the film? Um, I didn't really mind it. I thought for what it was, it was a nice 
addition to the Ant-Man uh, movie franchise, I didn't really think it was that bad. I, I was expecting, like, when I watched it earlier, I was expecting it to be, like, a bad movie. I didn't really think it was uh, as bad as people were, you know, criticizing it online because <laughs> I feel like the... I, I think that Paul Rudd really nailed his performance in as Ant-Man, especially in this movie. And I think Cassie, like, that dynamic, too, now that she's, like, older now, I think that was cute as well. Mm. So, I like I liked the movie for what it was. It was, like, a fun, family-friendly, comedy type movie. I liked it. And I also loved, I think Hollywood is starting to recognize what a talent that Jonathan Majors is. Mm. I feel like he absolutely crushed his role as Kang. He was a villain. Like, he was very menacing. And very like, like from him being like a like I don't think it was, I don't think he's a comedic actor, but like for him to like be taking on these like dark roles now, like from mm. where he was like in when he was in Love Lovecraft, right? Like I feel like that shows how much range you has in, he has as an actor, and I feel like him just being like that villain and his line delivery. It was just badass for me. I liked it. Yeah, I mean, and just to see, like, the growth of Kang as, like, as a villain, because when he was with Janet, he was gonna, uh, he was offering her, like, I can send you back to your daughter, and to be like, you never left. To being very, um, just a sweet, kind man that is just offering this huge reward for her assistance. To when he gets to Lang, he's like, yo, you're going to help me get my power cell back or I'm going to kill your daughter. And I'm not only going to, like, kill your daughter, I'm going to loop it so, like, you will continue to watch her die over and over again. She's just cold, man. Cold-blooded. It's just, it's just cold. And I was like, god damn. Like, I think, like, he might be... Is it fair to say he might be the darkest villain we've seen so far? Um, do you think he's darker than Thanos? Thanos wasn't about to like watch you. He was more merciful because he was like, I mean, kill his own daughter. No, I mean, true, but he was like (laughs) crying over it though, like. I mean, yeah, yeah. Oh, you, oh, you, yeah. Cause you, you know I feel I mean? like, like King you, had like no remorse. Like he was like, I'm gonna do this. Yeah, like I'm ready to like yeah. end whoever I gotta end. Um, I'm gonna kill for mine. Yeah, uh, Thanos was more sympathetic. The whole reason okay. that he got the gauntlet and the Infinity Stones was like, I don't want to have mm. to slaughter people anymore because you know, I mean, it was just so oh, I don't painful. Know. <laughs> but with a staff, don't they don't feel bother. anything. They just they don't exist anymore. Mm. So I think that hey, was, even though he shows like sympathy, sympathy for and remorse for his actions, like empathy, I guess he still did it. And I just I mean, feel yeah, like it's still mass genocide, but yeah. he was more compassionate about it. If that makes sense, like mm, if yeah. to have a snap where they just disappear, they don't feel pain, and it's like random. So it's not like I'm picking specific groups of people that have to go. It's anybody can fade. So I think Thanos is a little bit more compassionate and merciful with with his genocide. Whereas yeah. King is like anybody catch these hands, if like he will do anything to reach his goal. It's like very hard. He's like almost similar to Killmonger because mm-hmm. dude didn't care about nobody. It's like his objective is is what matters at the end of the day. Okay, yeah, I can see the similarities. Yeah, so I think like Killmonger and Kang are kind of up there to being like the darkest, whereas like Thanos was, you know, a little bit more, you know, humble. Uh, not humble, but um. Uh, Compassionate, compassionate in his genocide. With his mass genocide. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I love the fight scene 
Marvel's just as good at fight scenes in general. Um, especially with the hand on the one on one um hand combat. Um we definitely got to see his creed work a little bit because he was Jack. Hands. Like, yeah, just, we gotta see like one bicep as like his clothes ripped. Um just and waste him, it. And just like it all my hands to lay. I'm just like <laughs> Jesus, it was like, you know what I mean? It was it was a really good fight, and it just shows, like, he was stomping out, too. Like, he was just... He was giving it... I just feel like with Marvel and their fight scenes, um, I really applaud them for, like, actually putting in the work to make it look as good as they make it look. It's grimy. It's like... They have they probably hired some, like, MMA fighters for some... Yeah, because um, those scenes drinks. were... That is, it was a little intense. hard to watch, because he was, like... Get it was really giving it. To, he was like really like being his ass. And it was just like I think that's why some people had to grab. It's like he was he he was really stomping out Ant Man, and mm. they're just it like kind of like, hard to watch. Yeah, but it was like the little you always got to root for the little guy, and he turned it out. Used the the Pym Tech to destroy the cell and send. Um, and, and also I applaud this. They left like the lingering question of whether Kane was dead or not. You know what I mean? And even had or like this version at least. Yeah. So like, in there are two post credit scenes. We had one where we got to see the variant. It's like the Rick Citadel. It's like Jesus Christ. It's just it like. So many kinds. They were was kinds. kinds. They was kinds. kinds. There's just so many kinds. Even a lizard kang. Get and a kang. You get a kang. Everybody get a kang. <laughs> and then we see in the, the second post credit scene, this is um we'll probably see in season two of Loki that we get Adok. It's timely. You know it's the so we see, and I've been looking at it like online. We get Victor Timely. I think I'm saying it right. Which mm. also, who as reference, they had that in the comics. They had it in the comics, but I'm like, that's a little bit on the nose, Kane. You really gonna make your <laughs> last name Timely? And then, mm. I, and then also like, I don't know. Okay, so this is what they said in the comic book. So, so like, I looked, watched the video on it, and they were, like, in the comics when Kang was defeated by the Avengers, he went back in time and hid in the 18th century, right? And renamed himself Victor Timely. So that's, like, the, what they're kind of hinting at with that post credit scene, is that Kang may not be dead. He just hid himself and took on a new identity. You gonna send but a black man back to the 1800s? That's what I was saying. I was like, how they gonna work? I don't uh, know what uh, mm. Like, I get it, like, he's from way in the future, like, year 3000 or whatever, but they didn't <laughs> have African-American studies then. They have critical race. Like theory. racism definitely exists in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yeah, so. so I'm just like, how is he? I mean, we we know that there were scientists in black scientists in the 18th century that have made ways, but I think it's going to be interesting to see a futuristic black man trying to create a new life in the 18th century. I, I forgot where would it take place, because it, sometimes it depends on the location, but yeah. still... You're still going to face racism regardless. He so it's just like... The 80s. He could, like, I don't know if he should have went, you know, that far back, but I think they're just trying to be as close to the comic, the comic as possible. But it'd be interesting to see... Um, 
how you know, but but then you know, there's some factors like if you're able to accumulate accumulate a lot of money, you know, sometimes that not all the time, but sometimes that kind of helps a black person navigate those spaces a bit better. But I'm kind of interested to see, like, I'm invested. I mean, I was already invested in season two of Loki. Um, but now that they have, like, oh, Victor timely in this, it's like, hmm. You have my attention, Marvel. So, I, overall, like, if you haven't had a chance to see it, or um, if you're trying to get your friends to go watch it, they definitely should. I know that uh, this movie is going up against Cocaine Bear. And now, you know... Oh, my God, and- Cocaine Bear. We need to watch that. We need to do a review next week. Oh, my God. I don't know if I could... Please! I heard some people say that it was good. I heard some people say, like, Cocaine Bear was good, but I'm just like, it's based off a true, true event. Um, but I don't like, know. People I, have, actually I, 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 for that. <laughs> I may wait till, like, it's streaming. I don't know if I would go to the theaters to watch it. Okay. But, um... But yeah, I mean, I I love the movie. I thought it was good for what it was. I do. Mm. I just love how they did just write Lang's character as this lovable, goofy dad, ex-con that's just really trying to get it together. That's making the most of his fame by having a podcast, a book, um, trying to raise his daughter, even though she's mostly grown and is like being her own person and um, making good trouble with being an activist. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, this has opened a lot of doors in terms of story with this movie and y'all should definitely watch it if you haven't done so already. Um, but let me know what you guys think in the comment, comics, comments, <laughs> let me know I'm what tired, you think. Girl. I am, it's been a long day, but let me know what you guys think of the movie in the comments. I really want to hear from you all. Um, because again, it's not just about me, it's about like us as a community of fandom that really appreciates what's out there. Um, thank you guys so much for watching and staying tuned, listening if you run po- uh listening to the audio podcast. Oh, so many socials. If you want to follow me on social media, make sure on all platforms, follow me at Noir Vibes DC. Uh, the website will be coming soon. A lot of updates and then possible some merch. I've been looking into that option as well. So stay tuned for that. Uh, like I said before, if you missed the live stream or if you don't want to just listen and just enjoy the visuals, make sure that you follow me on YouTube again at New War Vibes DC. And again, thank you so much for supporting my channel and my publication. I really appreciate you guys so much. And make sure that you like, share, comment. You guys make a difference. And remember, you can't go wrong when you go with the flow. I'll see you guys next time. Say bye to the audience, Ziggy. Bye, y'all. Thanks for having me. I had fun. Me too. All right. I'll see you guys. Next Friday, same time. All right. Bye. Bye.